there we go. You're the one who asked about um, protein ligand complexes, right? Yeah, I've been curious about those for a while. So protein crystallization is almost an art form because it's very, very hard. Generally, the, the way that they started is, is just by starting with your protein dissolved in a solution, and then you just um, very slowly usually remove the solvent, um, usually without heating it because you don't want to denature the protein. So at most, you would heat it up to the body temperature, the organism that that, that, that protein comes from. Um, but it's also very tricky because you also have to maintain the right pH, and pH can change as concentration changes. Um, so it's it's very, very tricky to get it to do well. And a lot of the times, the, one of the trickiest parts about it is you never actually know if you've done it properly and if the crystal that you got to, to crystallize actually mirrors um, the conformation in in a cell because sometimes their conformation is and their their um, secondary and tertiary structure is going to change as it crystallizes so they don't you don't know entirely that you've done it properly <clears throat> unless you can sort of describe the mechanism based on the structure that you get when you crystallize that you then have to say okay and this can work with the um, mechanism that we're pretty sure happens because look at this structure over here or look how the ligand is bound over there. Um, but it's really hard to do things like estimate binding affinity from a from a crystal structure um, because you don't know how the water molecules, how the solvent would normally interact. Um, so it's these days, it's mostly done in conjunction with computational studies where you model the, the active site to show what the, um, the binding affinity is and where you can do, um, remember doing um, enzyme kinetics in intro to biochem? Um, there are some studies you can do that way where you can, where you can work out backwards what the binding affinity is. Um, because the binding affinity is going to be one of those k values that you can um, that you can calculate if you have enough data from the from the kinetic side. Hmm. So all in all, it's still very tricky, and still they're they're not usually isolated. Usually, you have to do the protein ligand complex as part of the entire protein. Um, if you're going to try to crystallize it out, you can't really separate one from the other because then it changes all the structure around and um, the binding site is part of the tertiary structure generally. So you can't easily sort of cut out the part you care about and just characterize that. You have to characterize the whole protein and hope that removing the solvent in order to do the x-ray crystallography doesn't change the structure of it. Yeah, I was thinking about it in the context of um, <clears throat> that large-scale docking. I think it's David Rothman, uh, I forget which university, has set up ultra-large-scale docking based off of the crystal structure of LSD and the serotonin receptor. And he's coming up with a bunch of new stuff, but it seemed like he needed that crystal structure with the ligand protein complex in order to do his docking simulation things yeah you you generally need a place to start in order to to get good computational results um or to do good modeling you need a place to start and that's that's one of the issues with protein crystallization is uh, the ligand does not always crystallize out with the rest of the protein occasionally because crystallization tends to purify things because things tend to crystallize into dis you know, if you crystallize a mixture um, of ionic compounds, you're really going to get one ionic compound crystal next to another ionic compound crystal. Um, and so it can be very hard to crystallize something with the ligand attached and be sure that it's in the right conformation. Um, and um, Wikipedia has actually got a fairly comprehensive article on specifically on protein crystallization. Um, and then getting the ligand part would generally be 
um, within this, if you can get it to crystallize out, then you can sort of zoom in. Once you have your, your x-ray crystallography data, then you can kind of zoom in and see what the ligand structure looks like if you got the ligand to crystallize out too. Um, so all in all, very tricky. And that's, that's one of the reasons why this, um, you can you can get your entire PhD and have four or five years of, of research work just crystallizing. Um, you know, these days, or it used to be that one, one protein, if you could get it to crystallize out, and then you had to do all the math by hand to do the, the um, crystallography data and turn it into a 3D structure, that was enough for a PhD. That was four or five years of work. Um, now that the computers can take the x-ray crystallography data and turn it into the, the 3D structure of the molecule of the protein a lot faster. Um, really, the, what's, what slows it down is the crystallization process, which can still take you know, a year to get a protein to crystallize properly. Um, and even then, you still might not be sure that you got the right structure based on the pH changing and, and protein denaturing as it crystallizes out. So it's, um, it's a pretty big field still because knowing what the structures of these proteins is very, very important for a lot of biochemistry. Um, and then Adam, I really liked your question about uh, how do we know what materials are likely to give away or hold electrons if you're doing static, static charge? So static charge is just what happens when you rub two materials together. And different materials will tend to keep different charges. Um, for instance, if you, um, amber is one that's commonly used as an example of something that's more likely to hold a negative charge. Wool holds a positive charge. Silk and glass hold different charges from each other. That's actually how Benjamin Franklin um, first, um, first, it's not discovered, but first characterized electricity in general and charges on electrons. Um, it was by rubbing silk on glass. And then he just noticed that they had opposing charges because they were still attracted to each other. And he just arbitrarily decided, okay, the one that stick, the charge on the silver is neg on the silk is negative and the charge on the glass is positive. Um, if he had just decided to name those opposite, then we would be talking about electrons that were positive and protons that were negative. Um, so he sort of set the tone for charge and electricity um, by, by doing that. And I think a lot of physicists wish that he had done it backwards um, because that would make a lot of things make more sense. If you could talk about gaining an electron meant that gaining charge as opposed to gaining electron means losing charge. We're, we're pretty used to that now by this point, you guys have spent enough time thinking about it that, um, that you're used to electrons being negative, but that in, in physics and engineering, it makes a lot of the math a lot easier when you can integrate, for instance, and get a positive number instead of a negative number. Um, it would make a lot, of, a lot of the math make more sense. You wouldn't be carrying random negatives around in uh, electrical engineering if that was the case. Um, but so from all the information that I could find, there's not a ton, there's, there's a lot of variables that go into which charges get, get kept. And it's gonna have to do with how stable the surface is um, in oxygen and whether there's any resonance that can happen if it's an organic material um, or you know what, what the electronegativity is, how many lone pairs there are. Um, so it's, it's very tricky to predict, and it's hard to tie it down to just one variable, it seems like. Um, although I'm sure electronegativity and lone pairs play a role because the one of the compounds, the one of the materials that is most likely to retain a negative charge when you, when you do static electricity is Teflon, which is entirely, which is big, long carbon chains surrounded by fluorines. So the fact that fluorine, a fluorinated organic compound is really, really likely to retain a negative charge more than pretty much anything else. And PVC for that matter, which is um, chlorinated carbon chains, um, tells me that either lone pairs or electronegativity must be playing a role to some extent um, because we're dealing, 
as we make things more electronegative, they're more likely to retain a negative charge. Um, but it's hard to to be predictive about it. It seems it doesn't seem like there's a um, way we can calculate it ahead of time. It's just something that's measured at this point. Um, and they call that the triboelectric um, effect or triboelectric series. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Thank you. I mean, I, I didn't think that Teflon or uh, PVC would do that either. But when you talk about the organic compounds and the fluorine and chlorine, that's there's so many there that makes sense. Yeah, but and it's still it's still the Teflon is still get weird to me that it would retain a negative charge because all the fluorines and carbons have full valences. So it seems like adding an extra negative charge would not be a beneficial thing because there's nowhere to put it in a valence. Um, so well, that's why. I, oh, sorry. I just it seems weird to me. It seems like the electronegativity must be playing a role, but it also seems like it's we're almost making like a metallic bond where we've got extra electron that's sort of like going to like hang out on the surface between all the other lone pairs because it doesn't fit in any valences. Yeah, that's why I had to, I, I asked because I was like, they're they're already full valence compounds. They're, they're they are as they are. So where where is this all happening and what's going on? So yeah, cool. I, I would guess that it's likely kind of because remember how metals act when you've got when you've got metals, metals have extra electrons that they don't really want, and they just wind up with that layer of electrons that's outside of their valence that kind of that's what allows metals to be good conductors. My guess is that the Teflon is doing something similar where you've got an extra electron, but it just kind of hangs out on the surface of this big long polymer covered in fluorine. Um, but I don't know why it's more likely to gain um, electrons than lose electrons, other than the fact that fluorine is not going to give any electrons up. Um, so just that was an interesting question, sent me down a bit of a rabbit hole uh, yesterday when I was uh, when I was looking at it, because I didn't know the answer to that. And it, it seems like nobody does really. So that's an interesting material science question at this point. Um, and that is the sort of thing that if you get into material science that you could use some of the, um, that's the sort of question that ab initio calculations could do a lot um, of, of uh, work towards answering because we can describe things in terms of individual orbitals and energies. Um, so you could do something like calculate the energy of a Teflon polymer that was neutral in a Teflon polymer that had an extra negative, um, had an extra electron and look at what that energy is compared to um, the energy of removing an electron from it, um, for instance. So that's that's the sort of thing that, um, that quantum calculations are really, really good at. And that's something that, um, frankly, I'm surprised. I, I was started thinking about it. There's probably three or four different ways we, you could use calculations to answer some of these questions. So I'm kind of surprised that nobody has done that so far. Um, so maybe it's, oh, I mean, I'm sure it's a lot more co more complex than um, I'm imagining, but at the same time, um, that's a cool research project, uh, if you ask me. The, um, the other thing about ab initio calculations that makes it really useful for material science is instead of doing things in the gas phase like we've been doing, we've been just treating everything like it's in the gas phase, like everything is discrete molecules. Um, you can simulate having a solvent, but one of the other more interesting things is you can actually simulate a solid surface that repeats infinitely um, by using sine waves to model the, the orbitals instead of using using discrete functions that that are in polar coordinates you can actually use sine waves to model that that repeat infinitely and so you can actually simulate an entire bulk material um meaning you know an entire solid or a surface by using sine waves to do it so you could do something like set it up so that you had a unit cell that was really long and skinny I lost you guys for a second. <laughs>
um, you could set it up so you had a unit cell. If you remember unit cells from when we talked about um, crystal structures in Gen Chem, um, you could set it up so, so that you had a unit cell that had a one Teflon polymer in it or two Teflon polymers in it um, that looked sort of like a long skinny box. And you could actually predict what the shape of these Teflon polymers would be in three dimensions with it repeating indefinitely in two, dim two dimensions. You could treat it like it was repeat. This polymer continued on infinitely, which is not a bad way to model polymers because they're such big molecules. Um, <clears throat> so there's, there's a lot of applications in material science um, for ab initio calculations as well. And this would be one example of a question you could answer with that. Um, one of the guys in my in my research group was working on um, on modeling uh, quantum bits for quantum computing by looking at oxygen OH groups attached to the surface of an of um, of aluminum oxide, and you could you could model what the energy levels were of the hydroxide on the surface rotating around, and you could actually use that as a quantum bit in theory where if, if the OH was pointed in one direction, it's one energy level. And if it's pointed 60 degrees over, it's a different energy level. And you could use that as a quantum bit in a quantum computer in theory. And he was doing some of the work on predicting what those energy levels might be and how they could do that. Um, and he had it set up so that it had to repeat as a surface. It had to repeat in two dimensions um, infinitely so that in order to model it properly. It's amazing what we do with sine and triangles. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I never got into the um, they call those periodic periodic conditions, periodic boundary conditions where it's repeating where you set it up as a unit cell um, and it just repeats every so often. Um, I never got into that as much because my work was more in OCHEM and OCHEM lends itself to doing things the way we did in our in our labs. Um, but it's fascinating the stuff they can predict from a material science point of view. Um, somebody asked, and this was the most common thing that, that, um, I think I marked anybody down on, on the quiz, um, was not putting an order to the reagents. When it asks you what reagents do you need to react together in order to get certain aldol or certain alpha beta unsaturated ketone, um, <clears throat> You need to specify if it's a crossed aldol con um, condensation where you've got one that you want to act as the nucleophile, then just like we practiced in class the other day, you need to specify this molecule reacts with LDA to make the enolate, and then you add the second ketone. Because otherwise, like this student was saying, um, you're going to wind up with um, at best 50% yield because some of your other molecules are going to react. The exception being if one of your ketones or aldehydes doesn't have an alpha carbon. So for instance, in one of them, one of the uh, answers you had, you used benzaldehyde to react. Benzaldehyde's never going to make an enolate because it doesn't have an, an alpha carbon, right? So in that case, you could get away without specifying. But for the most part, if it, we if we have two different molecules we want to react in one of these enolate reactions, you have to specify which one you want to put, which one you want to make the enolate first, and then add the second molecule. Um, so you you know I didn't didn't take off too many points for anybody who did that, but something to remember with these with these reactions is that we can control that. We just have to be careful about what we're using when. <clears throat> um, and actually on the grading note, um, hmm. 
Uh, I'm working on getting all of your grades up to date so that there are no surprises for anything um, will come finals week. <clears throat> um, I think for your class, for this class, there's not a whole lot. Um, I'm only a couple assignments behind. I've got to grade your distillation lab that, that was just due last Friday and then your research project. I just have to put grades in for those as soon as they all get submitted. Um, so just uh, make sure that you have that turned in and that way there'll be no surprises and the the la or the presentation grades I'll put in um, you know basically right after after the presentations are done. So you should be able to go into finals week knowing exactly what your grade is with the exception of the, the practice test and which will be your your last homework assignment and the final itself. Um, and again, the final will be going in the same um, the same category as the midterm. So it won't dramatically, it won't be as dramatic of a change to your grade. If you bomb the final, but you did good on the midterm, then that, you know, your midterm grade will kind of boost your, the final and, and that'll cushion you a little bit. Um, and all you have to do to raise your grade is do better on the final than you did on the midterm. And then your grade in that category goes up and that means your overall grade goes up. So if you're happy where your grade is, just make sure you do as well on the mid final as you did on the midterm and you should be fine. Elke? Um, so can you, like, are you gonna keep going with the, the trend of like setting us up due dates to make sure we're on track or when do we need to have our PowerPoint done or presentation ready to present? So at this point, we're next, turning that over. Yeah, so I'll have you submit that, and then um, that way, that way, anybody who has um, connection issues, if you're having connection issues when it comes to presenting, I can present your PowerPoint for you, and you just say next slide, please. Um, okay. To to because depending on your technology, um, screen sharing might be too much for your internet connection or your computer. Um, so I'll have I'll open up that assignment so you can submit that. Um, the day and remember it's going to be due you're doing the presentations next Tuesday um, so no more internal deadlines other than get me that presentation the day of the presentation and be ready next Tuesday um, we might not fit be able to fit everybody in next Tuesday and in that case um, some people will be presenting Tuesday of finals week in our regular in our same time slot um, but I would really like everybody to have your presentations ready to go by Tuesday. Um, so you're not still working on that when you should be studying for, for your final exam. Um, but no, we're, we're all the way down to it at this point. No more internal deadlines um, okay. built in there. So be working on that this weekend. And I'm, I'm not giving you a quiz this weekend because I'm expecting you to be spending your time working on your presentation and getting ready for, for next week. Did that answer your question, Elke? Yes, it did. So this oh. coming Tuesday, be ready to present. This, be ready to present this coming Tuesday. Some of you might not present this coming Tuesday, um, but I want your presentations ready and turned in then so that you're, you're good to go the following Tuesday if need be. And Adam, did you have a question too, or did I answer it? Yeah, that was it. Cool. Um, and probably, I will probably put out a um, an announcement that you can <clears throat> sign up for. Um, you know what order we want to do the presentations in, and then we'll just stop the presentations when we when we run out of time on Tuesday and pick them up during on the Tuesday of finals week. Um, but I'm at this point, I'm I'm not going to let you sign up for the following Tuesday. Um, because I want everybody to be ready this coming Tuesday. Um, if that if that makes any sense, it feels like you know if if I'm already acknowledging that we're probably going to go into the following Tuesday, seems like I should just let you sign up for it. But that wouldn't necessarily be fair for everybody else who has to be ready this coming Tuesday. So I want to have all the presentations ready, even if you're the very last one, and you're pretty sure that you're going the next Tuesday. I still want your presentation ready to go. And Elke. Um, and then 
just to follow up, I, I maybe I missed it, but um, the lab that you was, that was due last Tuesday, you extended it to this Friday. Is that right? Or or is it? Um, or do we see. not have an extension? Um, the two D NMR is it does say. <laughs> excuse me. Yeah, I don't mind extending this till this coming Friday. Um, since you everybody was still working on it and still seemed, um, I don't mean this to sound condescending, but so, seemed like um, there was still a fair number of you who are struggling on this Tuesday, last Tuesday. So I'll give you till Friday um, to to get that turned in and still have it be on time. Um, but you know. The, the reason that I usually resist doing full on extensions, even for people who have a, a, a good excuse is that I, um, I really don't want your deadlines to get piled up on top of each other too much because then it gets super overwhelming. You got you folks are good enough students at this point that I know that eventually you'll get everything turned in, even if you're behind on stuff. Um, but just as a general habit, I try not to do that because my Gen Chem students and intro to Gen Chem students, um, I notice that as soon as somebody gets behind um, and on some of the deadlines and stuff starts stacking up on top of, you know, week seven starts stacking up on top of week six, um, people disappear and just give up. Um, I'm not expecting anybody in this class to do that, but it's still a good habit to be in. Make sure that you don't have too many outstanding assignments at any at any one time. So um, try and get that in by Friday, ideally later today. I do have office hours after class today if you have questions on it and want to go over some of that um, second uh, problem there. So um, yeah, so and then, then we're getting down to it. No more lab assignments. Once you get that 2D NMR, it's done. You'll have, and uh, no more quizzes. You're done with quizzes. One more homework assignment and your presentation in the final and then you're done and the homework assignment is going to be the practice practice test um just like we did for the midterm so i'll get you that probably next tuesday um uh, i will set that all up so that you guys can and start looking at it after your presentations are done you can start looking at the practice test and have questions for the review on thursday um, yeah, and then we're then we're good. Any any other end of the quarter scheduling questions? Okay. Then let's let's continue on. We only have two new mechanisms, and then we're done. Um, so they're called Michael additions and. Uh, stork enamine synthesis. Um, so this is just a reminder how the, I guess we know we didn't quite get to this reaction. Um, once, we, once we make an alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl, which is that molecule there where you've got an alkene bond in between the alpha. Well, that's really annoying. I really wish Zoom would stop doing that. Let me get the slides back up again. Um, so once we once we make that, is it? Uh, it's not dropping out for you for you folks before before me, right? It just sort of you guys were hearing what I was talking about the alkene bond and everything. Okay. Um, once we do that, once we see the, the alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl, we actually have a couple different reactions that can happen because we actually wind up with, with two different partial positives on this molecule. Um, once we make this compound, here's the neutral state, which is going to be the most stable resonance structure. But there's also a resonance structure that puts a positive charge on the carbonyl carbon and a negative on the oxygen. And that has a resonance structure that puts a positive charge on the beta carbon. 
So your alpha carbon can act as a nucleophile. Um, it's not very much once you go through this aldol condensation, but the beta carbon and the carbonyl carbon can be a nucleophile target. Or if we're talking, if we're switching our, our frame of reference, we can refer to it as an electrophilic position. We have two carbons that can that can be attacked by a nucleophile. Um, and it has to do with these resonance structures, these partial positives. Um, and that, that also gives us the um, result of having, having us be able to go through a beta addition. So similar to when we did the um, if we had conjugated dienes, we could have a 1-2 addition or we could have a 1-4 addition because of the resonance structures of the intermediate, right? Um, you know, if we had something that looked like, like this plus HBr, if it was just an alkene plus HBr, we add a hydrogen to one side, and we add the bromide to the other side, right? And we look at the, at the substitution to determine which of those is going to be more stable. If it's a conjugated diene, we wound up with an intermediate that looked like that looked like this. This looking familiar? I think this is the last chapter we looked at last quarter was those conjugated dienes. But then your intermediate also had a resonance structure. So this would be, the way I have it drawn would be the one, two addition, but we could also have the one, four addition where you put the hydrogen at one end of this conjugated system and the bromine all the way at the other end. Um, and what this, we can wind up with something similar happening with these alpha beta unsaturated carbonyls because we have a similar system really. It's not gonna be a one two versus a one four addition, um, but it is something where we can wind up with the addition happening and it's separated. <clears throat> the more reactive nucleophiles, are going to favor the one, one, two addition. And more stable nucleophiles are going to favor one, four addition. So one, two addition would look like this. So we're, we're going to be um, reducing the carbonyl and adding an R group to the carbonyl carbon. So this just looks like if we ignore the double bond, this like looks like one of the first um, reactions that we learned for aldehydes and ketones, right? If we put an aldehyde or ketone with a strong nucleophile, it can reduce that carbonyl um, and put a nucle attach a nucleophile to that carbonyl. If we do it with um, this conjugation, and a more stable nucleophile, meaning it's not super reactive. So remember these Gilman reagents that had the copper and the lithium involved? Those were the ways we had of selectively reducing um, a, a carboxylic acid derivative without reducing it all the way to the, um, to the alcohol. If you do this, if you have an alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl and you expose it to a Gilman reagent, you get one four addition where you are going to break that alkene bond and put your R group on the beta carbon. Right, so this is sort of just an extension of once we make these alpha beta unsaturated carbonyls from these crossed aldo aldol condensations, we can then turn around and put an R group on the beta carbon. 
and sort of, and basically where the OH was. So before, when we made the, this crossed aldol product, before it went through the condensation reaction and eliminated a, an OH, it looked like it looked like this, right? And then if you heated it, we wound up driving off a water molecule to make the alpha beta unsaturated ketone. And now what we're saying is if you expose it to a Gilman reagent, we wind up putting that an R group Remember, a Gilman reagent is not strong enough to reduce a, car, a aldehyde or a ketone. But it turns out it is strong enough to reduce a alpha beta unsaturated ketone and turn it into uh, and alkylate that beta carbon. Right. So essentially, the net reaction here is that, is that we wind up replacing that OH with the, with the R group, if we used the stronger, um, the stronger reducing agent, a, a Grignard reagent, then we would wind up with it making the alcohol, we wind up making not quite an enol because the OH is not directly attached to the alkene. So we can just control whether we're gonna put the R group on the carbonyl carbon or on the beta carbon by using a Grignard reagent versus a Gilman reagent. That weaker Gilman reagent is the one that puts it on the beta carbon because it can't reduce the aldehyde. So this next reaction is basically combining the alpha carbon chemistry with the beta carbon reaction that we just did. Uh, it's called the Michael reaction. Um, so remember that doubly stabilized enolates, if we put a hydroxide with a, with a beta diketone, we wind up making an enolate that's gonna look like this, that's pretty stable. We don't need to use LDA to make the enolate if it's a doubly stabilized enolate because we wind up um, having enough stabilization from the resonance that just regular hydroxide or, or ethoxide is, is strong enough to do that. Um, and that makes it, the fact that it's stable as the enolate means that it's not a super strong uh, nucleophile. So that means it's stable enough that it will do the 1,4 addition. And we can actually wind up with this molecule adding right there to the beta carbon. And after step two, we wind up with an intermediate that would look like not positive, negative. Actually, let's draw the rest of the molecule first. We attached our doubly stable, our enolate to the beta carbon. And we had to sort of push electrons out of the way to do that. 
instead of breaking a pi bond by pulling the electrons like a nucleophile would, or like an electrophile would, we wind up breaking the pi bond by pushing the electrons away because it's a, a nucleophile attack. And that means our last step, the H3O plus, is just going to protonate where that negative charge is. So this is yet, yet another um, version where we can wind up changing the carbon skeleton if we're careful with this. And, and basically, that's one of the most important thing about alpha carbon chemistry is that almost every one of the reactions we've been talking about in this chapter is a way of changing carbon skeletons, sticking molecules together and making new carbon-carbon bonds, right? Which in terms of synthesis is a pretty powerful thing. Um, the easy synthesis reactions, and I use the word easy pretty loosely there, um, is when you can start with something where the carbon structure is already close to what you want to make. If you have a natural product, something you have a lot of access to that's already close to the right carbon structure, those are the easy synthesis problems where you've got to add maybe a methyl group here, or you've got to change a double bond to an OH or something like that. Um, the synthesis problems where we need to, to make our own carbon structure are the ones that get really, really interesting and tricky. And this is a way to do that in a pretty sophisticated way. It's tricky because it's you still have to have the right starting materials um, but it's a way that you can basically start with from pretty complex molecules and then stick them together and now we've got something that's that's a totally different molecule than either of the pieces we started with um, so they call this the michael reaction when you have it when you have the one four addition happening with a di-stabilized -sta enolate. Um, and so they refer to this as the Michael donor and the Michael acceptor. The Michael donor is the nucleophile. And I'm not sure why they went with a totally different name here, other than apparently Michael really liked to hear his own name um, or his students did or something. Um, and you do see that in, in organic chemistry with some of these naming systems. If it got really popular really fast because they were it solved a particular problem that synthetic chemists were dealing with, then it runs up showing up everywhere, all over the place really quickly and gets its own name nomenclature sort of associated with it. Um, my favorite ones are the ones that are more descriptive than the, just saying the name of a person. Um, there was a particular cyclo addition that's really, really commonly used called a click reaction um, because it happened very quickly and irreversibly and stuck two pieces together. Um, so they called it a click reaction, like fastening a seatbelt. Um, that to me was a lot better than Michael reaction and Michael donor and Michael acceptor. Um, but you know, you work with what's in the in the literature at this point. Um, the Michael acceptor is the one that's getting the extra electrons added to it, that's being attacked. We're, we're talking about donor of electrons and acceptor of electrons in this context. Um, and unless you get into a particular field where this reaction winds up being really important to your research or to a specific technique that gets used um you know you probably will not see this is not the sort of thing that would show up on a standardized test on the mcat or the the dental app was it the dat um or anything like that it does wind up being used if you get into more on the synthetic chemistry side um but until you get there it's not unlikely this is not a super widespread reaction it's one of those things that you know, three years down the road, you might see something like this. Like, I think this seems familiar and go back to your OCHEM book. Like, oh, yeah, we spent two days on this three years ago. Um, so it's not like Grignard reactions or SN2 reactions that always repeatedly show up on every standardized chemistry test that you will see moving forward. Um, I don't even know if this showed up on my chemistry GRE, to be totally honest. Um, I'm, it may have, and I just didn't recognize it. But then again, I did pretty well on my chemistry GRE, and I don't think I remember seeing this on that. Hmm. 
All right, so let's do some practice on this and take our break. So let's come back at nine o'clock and we'll go through um, what the products would be here. All right, give this a go. See you in 15 minutes.
Hey, Sean, do you have a minute? Yeah, what's up? Uh, I have a uh, physics uh, assignment. I was wondering if you could help me. Um, we're supposed to find out exactly where our electricity is produced up here in Lake Tahoe. And I was wondering if you knew that. Where it's like actually produced, um, not just the company. I know that it's not in the basin because that's why we can wind up with pretty broad swaths of the basin going um, losing electricity at the same time. I think it comes through the pass that's that's behind Sierra House um, that connects to like the power line um, mountain bike trail that goes along the, the big power lines, the parallels yep. uh, Pioneer. I'm mm -hmm. pretty sure. So I think it comes from south south of us. I don't know beyond that though. Um, I know that there are fairly detailed maps of power plants in general around. Um, and you might, yeah, because I don't think that they put that on any of the utility bills. I've actually got my Liberty Utility bill right here. You might just try Googling Liberty Utility power plants and see what's closest to us. And if it's to the south or southeast, then that's probably it. Hmm. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's what, I mean, she was saying that even Kathy, when uh, back when she did it, like she, it was kind of like, um, I don't know how to put this without sounding wrong. Like they think you're a terrorist basically if you're, if you're trying to find information on like a power plant. Yeah. She said it's not available, readily available information. You kind of have to dig a little bit. Yeah, I would start, I would see if you can get, I know that there's some fairly high resolution um, like nationwide maps of these are all the power plants in the US without too much information on them. Um, but you might start from there and the idea that, and see if you can find something that lists like power plant by utility company. I know a lot of utility companies share power plants to some extent, um, but you might be able to find something that's, that has a list of ownership um, and then you know, apply it to that and see if you can figure out exactly what's what there is. It's still probably gonna be a bit of a guess, but I do know that it's, I'm pretty certain it's out, out of the basin to the south um, is where we, our power comes into the basin. I don't know beyond that. Cool, thank you. No yeah, problem. I mean, it's, it's enough. It's a cookie crumb trail, I guess. Yeah, that's, that's where I would start. <laughs> And I only know that because we had a power, because we had a power outage one of our really windy days um, when, and I, you can kind of track power outages to the, where the main power line is, where that, where the breakage occurred. And I think we had one that, that knocked out all of South Lake Tahoe, at least on the California side. And it wound up that the breakage was, was, um, in the national forest south of Sierra House. So give that a go. And um, just a few, a few, um, we have not gotten to organometallics yet. I think that'll probably be what we do our special topic on next Tuesday. Um, but just a, as a reminder and um, that organometallic com um, complexes wind up being really interesting because they do wind up breaking our octet rule. Um, remember that when we have D orbitals involved, we can go up to um, six and occasionally even seven bonds. It's been theorized that you could have eight bonds to a metal um, in order to <laughs> make use of that D orbital. Um, so you wind up with structures that look like this. We've got molybdenum surrounded by um, carbon monoxide and they, this would be called molybdenum. I see molybdenum hexacarbonyl. They refer to these carbon monoxide molecules as carbonyls when they're a prefix, when they're um, in these, these complexes, um, which I bring this up mostly because um, that would be our next chapter normally. And this popped up on my feed. And I thought that that was funny because 
carbon monoxide is very, very strongly attracted to transition metal ions and almost always will make more than four bonds. So organic chemists that can only count to four but not five um, struggle with that because it goes against all the rules we've been practicing all year. I thought that that was funny. And uh, also, you can wind up with uh, a domino effect if you start out liking chemistry. Um, eventually, it cascades into organometallic complexes in, in university classes. Um, and it doesn't seem like any of the individual steps that led you to that point were, any, were unreasonable. Um, but all of a sudden, you're dealing with organometallic complexes and trying to figure out Michael, Michael donors and Michael acceptors. And you just started out because you like the fun colors and setting stuff on fire when you were a kid. Started right. out as fun and games. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Gen came is all fun and games. And now you have to dig into it a little bit. <coughs> Actually, Sean, what would uh, you showed? A, that was still a six uh, substituted um, methyl. Wasn't that so? How would you fit eight? Would it just pop in another one and kind of bend over those top ones? Yeah, you if you can picture it. It's a little bit like if you if you had a square planar or sorry, a square pyramidal shape. Um, I could probably draw it faster than I can find one. It's if you certain metals, you can wind up with it where you've got sort of a square pyramidal shape in two dimensions. And then so then you would wind up with one sticking up like that, one up in, in between these two. one going straight back. So it's like two square pyramidal shapes that are stacked on top of each other and sort of staggered. Yeah, I see, um, that's pretty crazy. That And that's about as, you see this sometimes in biochemistry because you, if you wind up with like two porphyrin rings on top of each other, you can suspend a transition metal in between them. Then it's got four electron donors above and four electron donors below. Um, it's far less common than having six ligands attached to it, um, to a transition metal, but you can do that. And you can, you can do seven as well. Seven looks a little bit weird. It looks like a planar pentagon around the middle with then one sticking straight up and one sticking straight down. Um, so this actually looks less sterically crowded than that, um, but it technically is a little bit more crowded if you look at the, all the bond angles and everything. Um, and, but that only really starts showing up when you get to transition metals and things that have d orbitals involved, right? Because you need space and orbitals that you can hybridize together to make that shape. Um, otherwise, if you don't have enough orbitals to do that, you're stuck with four bonds like we're used to for carbon. Um, and as, as I recall, it's, the, for these, there's a fair bit of experimental evidence there are some pieces of evidence that suggest you can even have a quadruple bond in between two metals if it's stabilized with the right organic ligands. Um, so that would look like a sigma bond, two pi bonds, and then something that looked like a hybridized D orbital around that. Um, but again, you can only really do that if you have a D orbital involved because there's not physically space if you only if you're limited to just s and p orbitals so that's why we don't see carbon quadruple bonded to other carbons <clears throat> but you can turns out some of those transition metals and some of those complexes wind up looking fairly complicated <clears throat> all right let's look at our practice problems here. So remember, if we're using, if we're using a Gilman reagent that's not strong enough to break up the carbonyl, but it is strong enough to do the 1,4 adduct. So we're going to wind up adding it to the beta carbon. 
which is the furthest carbon from or of the pi bond from the alkene. So there's our alpha, there's our beta. So our net result here was we're at our R group is an ethyl. So we're going to end up adding and uh, let me get a blank screen on the right hand side so I can. So for A, we're going to end up adding an ethyl group to the beta carbon and not touching the, the carbonyl. So we break up the carbon-carbon pi bond. And we can see this anytime you've got a, an alkene conjugated with a carbonyl or really any um, carbon to another electronegative element. Um, so the carboxylic acid derivatives can do this as well. Um, so in particular, we, we've used Gilman reagents as a way to selectively reduce carboxylic acid derivatives and turn them to the aldehyde. Um, but if there's, a, if there's a conjugated carbon carbon pi bond, that's even more likely for the Gilman reagent to reduce that. So the cyanide, if we draw the, the actual structure instead of just the condensed structure, we still have a carbon to a more electronegative element pi bond that's conjugated with a carbon-carbon pi bond. So our product is just going to look like we're breaking that carbon-carbon pi bond doing the 1,4 adduct. Um, and it still works with more traditional carboxylic acid derivatives. Find the beta carbon, add your ethyl group, or whatever your R group it is. If it was dimethyl copper lithium, then you'd be adding a methyl group. If it was diisopropyl, you'd be adding an isopropyl group. <coughs> um, and these are a list of the common nucleophiles that you can have attacking those alpha beta, alpha beta unsaturated carbonyls. I guess maybe that's reason one reason why they call it a Michael reaction instead of um, being more descriptive because alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl is a pretty big mouthful. Um, so those di-stabilized enolates, um, and those can take a lot of different forms. Uh, even having a nitro group conjugated with a that's directly attached to a, an alpha carbon that has an electron. So you wouldn't see this with a nitro group attached to a benzene ring because then the, the alpha carbon doesn't have a proton it can lose. Um, but if you have a nitro group attached to an alkene, or sorry, an alkyl group, you can wind up with that alpha carbon um, being acidic and making an enolate that way. It's not technically an enolate at that point, um, but we do see this fairly commonly as a way to add an, um, a, an R group. And then you can turn that nitro, once you've done this, you can turn that nitro group into an amine by reducing it. And there were a couple reactions that did that for us. So this winds, from a syn synthesis point of view, this winds up being kind of helpful because we do a lot of stuff with amines in pharm pharmaceuticals. We don't do much with nitro groups in pharmaceuticals because they're too reactive. But if you could use this reaction to add um, a bunch of carbons with a, with a nitro group and then convert it to an amine, that could be useful for sure. Uh, 
um, if we want to show the mechanism for these, we already kind of did that as an example. But just a reminder for how these Michael reactions work is your first step is you wind up deprotonating your disubstituted, disstabilized uh, alpha carbon. So if you have your hydroxide around or any, any strong base, we wind up making the di-stabilized enolate. And then if we expose that to an alpha beta unsaturated ketone, a Michael acceptor, you can wind up with that negative charge backing here, pushing the electrons over, and you're gonna get an intermediate that looks like your Michael acceptor, then attached to your Michael donor, Now we have a negative charge on the alpha carbon. And now that molecule, step three, is just going to be protonating that. So whatever our acid is, we wind up with the negative charge here, backing the acid. And actually, the product is not drawn, right? So we'll draw the product, which is just going to be the same as our second intermediate, except with the hydrogen added to the alpha carbon. So it'll look something like, if I can draw this in a way that I'm going to actually have room. And always double check that we didn't lose any carbons. So this was our was our uh, Michael acceptor originally. We have all the carbons there, and. That was our Michael donor originally, and we have all the carbons there. So again, when we start getting to these larger addition reactions, um, it really can be tricky to, to follow my, my handwriting. It starts looking a little bit like, like Charlie, with uh, Pepe Silva from Always Sunny, um, that uh, by keep track of where your electrons are going, count your carbons at the beginning and the end, make sure that you still have everything you started with as far as the carbons go. Um, and you should be okay. I think, frankly, the, the place that that is the trickiest to keep track of your carbons is a lot of times it's on the, if I give you the, the addition product and ask you to split it up into the pieces that started with, like the quiz question, because what happens is you look at, at these two pieces on your product and the temptation is to add an extra carbon to each of them, because it looks like the part that I circled in red 
is connected to another carbon, right? And so it, it's pretty easy to draw this as, you know, everybody gets the cyclohexyl and gets the carbonyl section. It's, but it's pretty easy to stick an extra carbon on there because the part that I circled in red has another bond attached to it, right? But you have to remember that the bond that's attaching your two pieces is just bond between the carbons that are already there. So you don't go outside of the part that I circled and add another carbon in order to do that, right? So just keep track of those. And when in doubt, count the carbons because if you counted all of the carbons or the carbon chain here between these, you should, you should have the same number of carbons before and after. If you miscounted, especially if you're in a hurry, it's really easy to, to miss that. But if you count your carbons before and after, you should wind up with um, the right number before and after. Right, and the mechanism, now that we're used to how enolates are made, the mechanism is pretty straightforward. Enolates are made just by deprotonating an alpha carbon, right? So it's a proton transfer step to make the enolate, and then you've got a nucleophilic attack, and then another proton transfer step. So more of the same as far as the mechanisms, where the proton transfer step looks different than what we've seen before, only in that we're deprotonating a carbon, which up till this chapter we had not seen before. Um, if we only have a singly stabilized enolate, we don't really wind up making very good yields. We can make the enolate with LBA and then expose it to a alpha beta unsaturated ketone and go through the same process, um, but there's winds up being too many side reactions that wind up happening. Um, and if there's, you know, you either the and and just in general, we're making that enolate which is pretty unstable, and so it's not making that enolate is not going to happen in large amounts and not going to stay stable enough to add here. It's going to wind up making some other side product products where, um, you know, if you had your negative charge here from, from making the enolate, it's going to make some of the one, two adduct. It's going to make some of the one, four adduct. It might even wind up reacting with, um, with other impurities instead. So because it's so reactive, you don't wind up seeing very good yields with this. So that's why we predominantly see um, either very strong electron withdrawing groups. This works the best if you have very strong electron withdrawing groups, like the nitro group, or you have to have two electron withdrawing groups on the same, uh, attached to the same alpha carbon. If you have two electron withdrawing groups on the same alpha carbon is when we see this reaction happening. Um, and a nitro group is just strong enough of, a, uh, of an electron withdrawing group on its own that the nitro group is the only way you can, you can really do this with just a single um, functional group attached to your alpha carbon. So one of the ways we get around that is if we turn the carbonyl into something that's that's going to stabilize the enolate more. And the, the easiest way to do that, short of, you know, we don't always want to convert the um, carbonyl all the way to a nitro group in order to do this, because that's a pretty hard process to reverse. But what we can do is we already have a, a reaction that converts um, a carbonyl into an enamine. And an enamine still has a resonance structure where there's a negative charge on the alpha carbon, but it's much more stable than um, an enolate, a singly stabilized enolate. <clears throat> so if we only have one carbonyl group nearby and we want the alpha carbon to go through this, the uh, Michael reaction, 
we convert it to an enamine first. And so remember that the enamine process, um, if we started from cyclohexanone, was if we react that um, with a secondary amine, we wind up with the amine acting as the nucleophile, pushing the oxygen away, making an intermediate that looks like if we have acid around in particular, and we're going to have an, a um, proton transfer step as well. We're going to get the intermediate that looks like this. And this is not showing all the steps along the way for this mechanism, because there was two proton transfer steps that would need to happen as well, right? You need to, the nitrogen to lose a proton, the oxygen to gain a proton. So there's two proton transfer steps that, that go along with this. And then you can wind up with the OH leaving as a water molecule. And the nitrogen making a pi bond. But then you've got a nitrogen with, with uh, four bonds, and it's more stable if it only has three. So you wind up with another proton transfer step, something coming in here and grabbing proton. Actually, you wind up with the, yeah, grabbing the proton. These electrons move over. These electrons come up to the nitrogen, and your result is the enamine product. All right, that should look familiar, right? Even if it's been been a bit. Making that enamine is when you got when you had a secondary amine reacting with a carbonyl, you turned it into an enamine. That winds up being a less electronegative, a, a less reactive nucleophile, because you wind up with the enamine itself as a resonance structure. You don't actually need to deprotonate the enamine in order to turn it into a nucleophile. So alpha carbons from carbonyls, we had to we had to deprotonate the alpha carbon to make it a nucleophile, and that's what made it so reactive. But here we just have a built-in resonance structure where the lone pair can come down here and the pi bond can move over. It's not going to be super common. It's not a huge resonance contributor because you're making um, molecule with two formal charges on it, but it's enough of a contributor that you can actually get that enamines um, alpha carbon to act as a nucleophile weakly. And so the fact that it's not as reactive means that that slows that reaction down and we can actually get a good yield on a Michael reaction. <clears throat> Right, so this would be the active nucleophile. You're just going to wind up again, still with that same beta carbon, or sorry, alpha carbon acting as the nucleophile towards the beta carbon of a alpha beta unsaturated ketone or a Michael acceptor. So if we had that reacting, So if we start there, let's look at <clears throat> these two reactants, the enamine 
of cyclohexanone reacting with this Michael acceptor. So there's our enamine. Its resonance structure is going to look like this. So then if we have our alpha beta unsaturated ketone, and I think, but it was an, no, it was a, put the last carbon in the wrong spot. The mechanism is going to look something like this. And then we made a new bond between the beta carbon so we break that carbon carbon pi bond leave the carbonyl where it is and then we do a couple proton transfers to get back to the enamine and protonate that last that last step. So because we then we now made another um, nitrogen, quaternary nitrogen, it's going to wind up deprotonating the other hydrogen here and reforming the enamine. And then we have our new carbon carbon bond is still there. So one carbon, two carbons, three carbons is to the carbonyl, and then one more carbon on the other side of that. Which now we can convert that enamine back to a carbonyl, right? That was those enamine formation reactions were all reversible. If we expose this to a lot of water now, we're going to wind up turning that uh, enamine back into being a carbonyl. So we, basically, we can use the enamine as a stepping stone in between a, a carbonyl, where we want to add an R group to the alpha carbon to a Michael acceptor. We just do it by way of turning it into an enamine first. And that slows down the reaction enough, you can get the one four adduct that we're looking for. And I did lose a carbon in there, didn't I? So it's easy to do. Everybody does it. And I only caught that because I started looking at my product and I realized that I didn't have a beta carbon associated with the Michael acceptor. And I knew that the Michael acceptor had to have a beta carbon in order for this to happen, right? And so then if I wanted to go back and double check, here's my original molecule. Here's my Michael acceptor. And my pieces have the same number of carbons. I've got four carbons and an oxygen on my Michael acceptor. So I've got to have four carbons and an oxygen on, on that part of the product. Right, so in the in the grand tradition of um, putting somebody's name associated with all of these, um, this is a stork enamine synthesis. So Michael reaction is if you do it with a double stabilized uh, enolate to make it work. If you do it with an enamine instead of a double stabilized enol enolate, then it's a stork enamine synthesis. 
and out of curiosity. And it's not referring to, um, to stork like the bird, it's gonna be somebody's name. Uh, and again, it has its own uh, Wikipedia page. Doesn't say anything about who Stork is per se. Gilbert Stork. Oh, Columbia. Um, from Belgium originally. Well, how about that? Uh, and doesn't look like this won him the Nobel Prize, but it did give him, he does have a bunch of other prestigious chemistry prizes, just not the big one. Um, probably because it's such a focused reaction. Michael Acceptor. Michael, on the other hand, Arthur Michael, uh, National Academy of Sciences. Yeah, not, no Nobel Prizes for him. So, always interesting. Tick. Typically, synthetic chemists, unless they make something that is really, really useful, unless they make something that turns out to be a very important pharmaceutical or they pioneer a technique that winds up being used by everybody in the biotech field or something that's directly applicable to medicine, um, you don't see a lot of synthetic chemists actually uh, winning a Nobel Prize. Nobel Prize in chemistry generally goes to chemists who work in the biology field basically that makes something that really useful in biochemistry or in medicine or that are working way more on the physics side so it's almost like a second physics nobel prize so the chemists that do things like um manage to you know design the the first scanning electron microscope um that can image individual atoms that's really more of an engineering and physics feat but because it's applied to chemistry they won a nobel prize in chemistry i believe um so pure chemistry doesn't get its recognition in the nobel prize because they pick things they vote for things that are applied all over the place that are really visible that said synthetic chemists don't exactly have it bad because everybody needs their help um, the biochemists and the physical chemists need the synthetic chemists help make the stuff that everybody else dreams up. <clears throat> so this, the overall stork enamine process <clears throat> has three steps that we went over. First, you turn the carbonyl into an enamine. And again, this is a reaction we've seen before. It doesn't even matter what the R groups are because we're going to turn it back to being a carbonyl at the end. It just has to be a um, secondary amine. <clears throat> it's really common actually to use uh, this molecule as your secondary amine because it, its R groups are part of the same ring structure. It's pretty stable molecule and it's pretty common, easy to find. Um, and and the name is escaping me at the moment. Um, hyperidine. Hyperidine is a really common molecule used for this um, because it's also a very stable liquid at room temperature. If you get to smaller R groups, then you wind up with something that's not as um, easy to work with. Like for instance, if you use dimethylamine, dimethylamine is barely liquid at room temperature. Um, and so you wind up losing a lot to, to evaporation. So piperidine winds up being really popular for this. Plus it's a pretty common solvent that pretty much every lab has sitting around in the stock room. Not just sitting around out, that wouldn't be safe, right? Um, so secondary amine, you lose the H2O, you make the enamine. Then we do a Michael addition, where we wind up with the enamine acting as the Michael donor, and you need an alpha beta unsaturated ketone to be the Michael acceptor. <clears throat> and 
I believe, you know, the enamine is not really going to be a strong enough nucleophile to do this to a just a regular ketone. You kind of need the extra stabilization of having the carbonyl here in order for this reaction to progress. And then we take our enamine and if you add it to add um, H acid to it, you're going to turn it back into being the key, the carbonyl again. So we wind up with the alpha carbon from one carbonyl adding to the beta carbon from another carbonyl. And so this is a, a way we can wind up um, very predictably. This, this is a little bit more, um, requires a little bit more finesse than if you just take your two carbonyls and do an, an aldol condensation, you wind up adding your two, the carbonyl carbon to the alpha carbon. This is taking an alpha carbon and adding it to the beta carbon instead of adding it to the carbonyl carbon. So if we wanted to, to put a, a new carbonyl an extra carbon away or two carbons away, if, it, if we had this reaction happening, if we made the enolate, Instead, we did the same reaction where we made the enolate instead and had it react with a ketone. Then we would wind up, so if we did this with this molecule instead, you would wind up with the alpha carbon adding directly to the carbonyl carbon. But by going the enamine and Michael reaction process, we actually, we add the alpha carbon to the beta carbon instead. So this is a process that allows us to put it here instead of directly attached to the carbonyl. So a, a subtle difference, but that can make a big difference in terms of synthesis. If we wanted to, we now have really good ways of adding things all over the place, right? We can add something directly to the carbonyl carbon, if we have, you know, if we started from that same molecule here, we have ways of adding carbons directly to the carbonyl carbon. If we had um, a Grignard reagent, we can add directly to the carbonyl carbon. Or if we turn this into an enolate, we can add something directly to the alpha carbon by just having it do an SN2 reaction by having the alpha carbon act as the nucleophile. If we wanted to add it to the beta carbon, we would need to turn this into an a beta alpha beta unsaturated ketone first. We would have to do something like um, put a bromine on the alpha carbon and then have it go through an elimination reaction in order to, to make the alpha beta unsaturated ketone. But then we could add something to the beta carbon. So that adds the alpha carbon. This adds the carbonyl carbon. We want to add something to the beta carbon. We would turn it into this molecule first, and then do the storkinamine synthesis, or use some other um, weak nucleophile to add something to the beta carbon. Right. So alpha carbon chemistry is tricky. But on the other hand, it gives us a lot of power to control where we're adding these, these different um, substituents when we're adding to the carbon chain. So let's try and do a practice synthesis problem. We're starting from this molecule. How can we get to 
the desired product here. We might start by figuring out what the piece is we're trying to add and whether it's being added to the alpha carbon or a beta carbon. So here we have it. If we started from a Michael acceptor, if we had this molecule and an alpha carbon, the alpha carbon could add to the beta carbon of our Michael acceptor, but we have to go through the stored enamine process first. Right, so our synthesis might look something like starting from our, our starting material, add uh, piperidine, and minus an H2O is going to turn that into the enamine. And now we can have this react as a Michael donor. And that's going to add to the beta carbon. So we're going to wind up with this attacking the beta carbon. Charge moves over. We make an intermediate that looks like try not to lose any carbons along the way. So two more carbons. And you can get a little crowded looking if you're messy like I am, but then it's just a proton transfer. You protonate that, and that's going to convert that enolate back to be, sorry, that um, enamine back to being a carbonyl. So if you just expose it to acid at the end, we're going to get our product. And our product is going to look like, so there's the carbonyl. We turned it back into the alpha carbon. One carbonyl adds to the beta carbon from the other carbonyl. So our overall process, that we might write here might look something like let's see where do I have room here? So step one, exposed to a secondary amine with acid, and you lose a water. Step two, expose it to our Michelson, um, our Michael acceptor. Step three, 
H3O plus. So all things considered, that's actually a pretty short synthesis to modify the, the um, carbon structure that significantly and in that that's um, specifically. But so that winds up being a pretty effective synthesis pathway, especially if you can buy your Michael acceptor or if you can mi make your Michael acceptor with a fairly um, efficient pathway. <clears throat> so making your Michael acceptor might be hard. Um, but you could make this Michael acceptor from, say, ethanaldehyde and formaldehyde. You could react them together to make this Michael acceptor yourself, right? Because we have three carbons to make that alpha beta unsaturated uh, ketone. You could start with two with a two carbon aldehyde and a one carbon aldehyde, and get them to do an aldol condensation to make this Michael acceptor as well. And ethanol and formaldehyde are both pretty common molecules. <clears throat> so it seems like we're almost cheating by just, by just throwing this molecule in as a Michael acceptor, but we can make it without too much trouble too in, in a one or two step process to make that aldol condensation product. So now that we know how to make the Michael acceptors and we can have a variety of different carbonyls that we can use as the Michael donors, we, um, this stork enamine synthesis winds up being a fairly significant reaction because it allows us to start with general stockroom ingredients and make very sophisticated molecules pretty quickly. <clears throat> or at least in, a, in a, just a few steps. And the fewer steps you can do, the better in most synthesis pathways. Fewer steps means better efficiency. Ah. All right, and we are in perfect timing. So that does conclude the alpha carbon um, chapter. So we'll do um, we'll do a special topics, not special topics. We're not going to cover a whole nother chapter in lecture on Tuesday, um, and it won't show up to very much in the final since we're not going to be able to get through the whole chapter. So the, the material that we cover on Tuesday. Um, I think that I what I settled on is going to be the best way to do it. Instead of just saying that it won't be on the test at all, um, the stuff we cover on Tuesday will be at most part of the wild card section, that wild card five points at the end. So I still want you to there, and I still want you thinking about it instead of just coming and tuning out because it's a special topics lecture. But it's not going to be more than five percent of the of the final exam. Um, seemed like a reasonable a reasonable way to start a new chapter um, without penalizing you guys for um, my scheduling issues. All right, so we'll end there.